welcome to Playback, the EBSN podcast. Uh, my name is Benjamin J. Heal. Um, this is the latest episode. Unfortunately, there's been a, a bit of a gap between this episode and the previous one, which was another video of the first panel at our uh, EBSN uh, annual conference uh, in 2021, which is held over the weekend of October the 29th to 31st. And um, yeah, it was our virtual first virtual conference, and we thought it went pretty well. And so today, I'm just going to introduce the second panel of the conference, which was titled Art and the Beat Generation. And chairing this panel was Peggy Puccini, with Estibulitz Encarnacion Pinado acting as the moderator. The speakers um, at on this panel with Beatrice Cordero uh, with a paper called Abstract Expressionists and the Beat Generation, Daria Barishkova, an art language radically revised, and Tangwe Harma and his paper Counterculture, Counterpower, Disengagement, the Art of the Beat Generation. So eh, please enjoy and remember to check out the website for all the new updates, um, book reviews, and um, interviews and publications that have been um, added to the to the website over the past uh, few months. Okay, great. Hope you enjoy, and see you at the next podcast. Ready to go. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm happy to chair this panel on heart and beat generation. We're going to have three present two, three speakers uh, in this panel. Um, the first speaker will be Beatrice Cordero. Uh, she's an assistant professor at St. Louis University on the Madrid campus. Uh, she holds a PhD in art history from the Universitat Complutense in Madrid. Her dissertation was on James Johnson Sweeney, a test breaker and test maker, uh, and his contribution to modern art narration between 1934 and uh, 1975. Uh, she is the author of many articles on Sweeney as well, and she curated an exhibition in Madrid entitled The Irascibles Painter Against the Museum. And um, she will be, um, er, the title of her uh, presentation, unless it has changes, One Language, Two Destinies, Abstract, Expressionist, and the Beat Generation. So um, this is your time, Beatrice. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you so much. Um, everybody can see my screen? Can you see my PowerPoint? Not yet. I mean, I can't see it, so most probably not. <laughs> Okay. Not yet. Sometimes it takes a little bit. Okay. Because we try. We tried. Now I can see it. Okay. All right. So let me. The clock. All right. So well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I am very happy to be part of this conference because um, I don't know much about the beat generation, but I am very intrigued and I want to learn. Um, so I come with a uh, learning uh, spirit, but I'm also very intimidated. Um, I just learned that you have been doing this for 10 years, this conference. So um, I think that this is going to be a, a great experience for me. Um, I want to talk about the, the different um, public acceptance. Um, when we compare the abstract expressionism and the beat generation, uh, we mostly find things in, in common for these um, two movements or, or groups. Uh, however, when I speak to my students or to colleagues or just friends, uh, I have a lot of trouble explaining who the B generation is. And I normally just have to mention Pollock or de Kunin for everybody to know what I'm talking about when I talk about abstract expressionist. So we are all familiar with the problems uh, that occur when we make generalizations, especially when you try to um, talk about the categorization of one entire uh, generation, in my case too, which is uh, even worse. Um, but I don't think, uh, and I would love to hear um, everybody's opinion about this. I don't think that uh, the two groups are uh, define very accurately yet after all these years. I think that 
if we focus on the chronology, I think that um, Pollock and Ginsberg, for instance, are only two years uh, apart. I think that Pollock was two years older than, sorry, that Burroughs, uh, even though there are um, a couple of uh, decades between uh, Ginsberg and the Kooning, for instance. Um, however, if we attend to the cultural work, and that's what I want to focus, uh, we realize that it was the year 1948 in which everything really started happening. Uh, that is the year that, of course, um, the phrase uh, big generation was created. And it is also the moment in which our critics and curators and museum directors start noticing, um, I will not say noticing, uh, really making um, a, a great deal about what it was happening in, in the art world, uh, especially in, in New York, of course. So um, if, if we, oh, sorry, um, if we consider the two generations, they did have um, more things in common, that things that brought them apart or that differentiate them, right? Like we all know about how they were trying to uh, stir things up, uh, um, both groups, how they were reacting to this very conservative society. Um, <clears throat> they were living in this uh, highly hypocritical, uh, uh, um, hypocritical uh, society uh, that it was very conservative. Uh, with these double standards, et cetera, et cetera. They were all very interested in other cultures, uh, either Native Americans or philosophies coming from the East. They were uh, sharing uh, uh, somehow romantic spirit about uh, having a different relationship with your own body, with your own uh, relationships, a different connection with nature, for sure. Um, they were at least in the beginning, rejecting materialistic and, um, and capitalism culture. And they, both generations wanted to transcend um, with their art and using uh, both um, spontaneity and improvisation and some kind of physical component in their creative act. So I don't really know what differentiates these two generations if, you know, when we see the most important aspects, what we see is that they have a lot of uh, things in common. And uh, that is what it has um, provoked, um, I think, new interpretations that kind of see um, many artists and writers and, and, and um, intellectuals, really, weeks, I will say, <laughs> I will almost say, uh, under the the, the same kind of umbrella. So in 19, um, 1995, the Whitney Museum presented this exhibition on beat culture that kind of included the absolute expressionist. Now the exhibition um, still quite a criticism. Uh, many people did not really accept this um, conjunction between the two generations. And um, I, I'm really intrigued about if um, most of the reasons were really in finding differences between these two groups or because the art, the visual art created by the, by the big nicks are, or is not really considered in the same realm, the actual expressionist, expressionist. And by that, I mean that um, all, all the, uh, big generation writers painted, all of them, uh, all except uh, Ginsberg, who was an excellent uh, photographer. Um, most of them showed um, their art, uh, of course, Ferling Getty who spent 60 years painting in Burroughs uh, show at Sefratzi's gallery, um, but their work has not been shown together or it was not shown together until 1994. Um, which I think is a pretty late uh, date for, for such an event. Now, um, I, 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 am, I am under the impression that when we talk about the visual work created by the uh, Bitniks, we have, people have the tendency to see it in a very anecdotal way. There is not a lot of um, 
a lot of criticism, or at least in comparison with the New York School uh, about the beat uh, artist. There is some controversy actually um, when placing artists like uh, Helen Frankenthaler or Larry Rivers. Larry Rivers, I feel like he um, he's in this very maybe uncomfortable, but also very rich uh, thin line between abstract expressionism and pop. And I think that most people will be very comfortable considering him a uh, uh, generation painter. Uh, with Helen Frankenthaler, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I think that culturally speaking, most people place her uh, in the milieu of the big generation, but then her art is normally considered to be um, first generation abstract expressionist. Um, so I think that this particular topic will be uh, very interesting for further discussion. I want to advance um, a little bit more into this um, uh, public acceptance. And um, I believe that what it was crucial in the recognition of the abstract expressionist, and I mean, everybody um, is familiar with this story, is that after uh, World War II, the, the visual rhetoric absolutely changed and it was used by uh, US government and uh, US institutions to present a very democratic vision of America. This uh, quote that you are seeing on my screen is is um, is, uh, is 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 an extract from the speech that President Eisenhower gave uh, on the occasion of the 25th um, anniversary of the inauguration of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, in which he says, and I quote, "Freedom for the art, sorry, freedom of the art is a basic freedom, one of the pillars of liberty in our land. Our people must have an impure opportunity to see, to understand, to profit." from our artists. When artists are made the slaves and tools of the state, when artists become chief propagandists of a cause, progress is arrested and creation and genius are destroyed. Let us resolve that this precious freedom of the arts, this precious freedom of America, will day by day, year by year, become even stronger, even brighter in our land. Um, I feel like this was in 1944 and it was at that moment in which um, not only President Eisenhower, but also the museums uh, and the media, of course, understood that they had this uh, amazing opportunity to present um, the very um, uh, uh, modern art as a very advanced um, characteristic of American culture. Uh, Life magazine and Time magazine play a fundamental role in the spreading and dissemination of, of abstract expressionist, expressionism. And as it is very well known, it completely catapulted the, the uh, career of artists like Pollock with very um, flashy um, uh, headlines like Jackson Pollock, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? This was an article published in 1949. And um, uh, this is another one uh, after uh, Pollock passed away. I think this is uh, 59. And Time, uh, Time Magazine um, also published uh, an article in which uh, Pollock was called um, uh, Jack the Driper as a reference to his uh, dripping technique, dripping oil on the canvas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what all these uh, wonderful photos and and um, you probably are familiar with the videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, what they did is they presented an an a totally uh, stereotypical image of this. Uh, macho personality that it was very in fashion also um, in the movies and in in literature this is the this stereotypical image of the frontier man the um, audacious uh, American man that is very very tough um, very brave and that is breaking um, or is groundbreaking the the, the arts, right? So we have these images that were projected 
And when people think of Pollock, when people even think of Rothko, which was a very complicated man, and even the Kunin, uh, to just name a few, um, we do have this, uh, we have a very different image than when we think of uh, Kerouac or uh, Ginsberg or Farley or, or whoever. And I think that the media and the uh, artistic institutions had a lot to do with this. Uh, lastly, um, around um, 1950, uh, well, in, in 1948, Peggy Guggenheim returns to Europe and with uh, all the avant-garde uh, art that she had bought previous to the war and the art that she collected in the United States, including Pollock, she uh, opens um, the, the museum in, in Venice. And in 1948, she exhibits all this American art in Venice, which is the uh, beginning of this reception of abstract expressionism in, um, in Europe. Together with that, uh, the American museums very quickly realized that um, they realized the need of, uh, of using this, um, this kind of art as part of the Cold War rhetoric, as I was saying before. And I believe that is um, very interesting that American uh, abstract expressionism is shown as such as a school uh, in Europe before being considered a school in the United States. Um, this image, which is the last one that I'm gonna show today, it's of an exhibition called The New American Painting, uh, which was a show that arrived to New York, organized by the International Program of the Museum of Modern Art, and it was exhibited in New York in 1958, very, very late. Uh, year, if we consider that it had been shown uh, in eight uh, Europe, uh, in eight European countries before that, and uh, notice that the title does not make any reference to New York, like the New York school concept was not even um, conceived by then. It doesn't say anything about abstraction or abstract expressionism or anything like that. This is like the new American painting that, um, as I said, it was shown in Europe before it was even shown in, in, in the US. So um, I think it's when we compare these two um, generations, I think that is very uh, difficult to make a difference or to make a cut between the work that they were doing, both, both groups, and the cultural work that their art produced. Um, and by that, I mean that it's very difficult to um, study abstract expressionism without having into consideration the political dimension of their exhibitions and their criticism and their art collecting. And it happens mm, you know, in, in a, in an opposite way, when you study the art of the degeneration, I think that it has still, uh, it drags this um, uh, characterization as counterculture that it can, I mean, uh, I think that there is another speaker who's gonna talk about this and I'm very, very intrigued about uh, what is gonna be said, but I think that even though both generations were in theory, at least in the beginning, showing or trying to do the same contracultural work um, because the abstract expressionist also wanted to create new, a new artistic form. It also uh, wanted to react against the, the mainstream uh, artistic world. Um, I feel like the beat generation has not yet um, surpassed all the stereotypical negativity that that is implied when when we talk about them. Um, so yeah, I this is all I wanted to share, and I am um, really looking forward the um, what other speakers are going to say about they are the B generation, and I will be um, ready for the Q and A questions about this. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Beatrice, for your. Um presentation of this encounter or reading, a parallel reading of uh, the beat generation and, and the abstract expressionist. And probably uh, there'll be questions about this issue of meditization, 
commodification of art and uh, literature perhaps, and this idea of being new or being recognized afterwards. So I leave that for the Q&A and um, I will uh, just introduce Daria uh, before she gets ready, as you get ready and share um, your PowerPoint. So uh, Daria um, Barishnikova is a doctoral candidate at the RWTH Aiken. Um, her PhD deals with the representation of mind in cut-up literature uh, through a comparative study also of Russian, British, and American text. And um, her primary sources, among her primary sources, are, of course, uh, Geisen and Burroughs. Um, she also was, or she also worked as an editor, had the Russian Heart magazine. So I'm sorry, Daria, I won't be able to pronounce the name of the magazine. Um, and her interest also goes to the relations and connection between visual art and literature. And um, uh, if I count by the abstract that you have sent, the panel's going to resonate very much from one uh, presentation to another. So I, um, it's your turn, uh, Daria. Thank you, Peggy, very much for this uh, introduction. Let me... And in my talk, I discuss the specificity of cut-up experiments in film in uh, relation to the conceptions uh, of perception elaborated by radical inactivism. And I will first uh, talk a little bit about cut-up technique and uh, its specificities, then about the film itself, its uh, themes, uh, elements, and formal devices. And finally, I suggest some way of interpretations. These film experiments continued Burroughs' collaborations with various artists that explore the, 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 um, explore the possibilities of cut-up technique. And uh, as the main characteristic of cut-up technique uh, is uh, the randomness in the processes of selection and or combination of the materials in a work of art. And therefore the distinctive features of a cut-up work are narrative non-linearity and a lack of coherence in the syntactic structure. So the nuances of the existing meanings of the work fragments are destroyed and the new structures are imposed. In contrast to conventional narrative in literature or also in fields, which are responsible for continual temporality, causality, and distinctive characters, cut-up narrative disrupt and deconstruct them by not attributing voices, refusing to explain transitions from one place or character or time or even sentence to another in a constant uh, dis direction and uh, shifting the focus of attention. Meanings here are not to be constructed from stable representation, but are to appear from arrangements of unstable markers, changing moments here and now, appropriating already existing blocks of information in conjunction with memoirs or in projection of imagination. So the question I investigate is if the film can depict not just a story of someone experiencing something somewhere or the what of a story, but uh, can mediate the very experiencing of being in a world or the how of a story, any story, and to produce images that are not always connected 
to representation and to provide the viewers with the possibility to create a story, any story themselves. I would say that the film cut-ups not only reflects upon the various forms of contemporary perception and imagination, but constitutes them as well. Now I suggest to watch a little fragment from the film To refresh. Hello. Good. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Where are we now? Yes. Good. Hello. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. 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 Yes. 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 Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Look at that face. Hello. Yes. Hello. And so on. In uh, what follows, I focus on the aesthetic strategies in this film and on the cognitive processes that presented on the screen. So I will argue that the subject of this film is the variety of modes of perception. And instead of construing these cinematic practices on the object-based model, I consider them in a framework in which experiences are not thought of as objects of perception, but rather as the ways in which we perceive dynamic and temporally extended processes. And that makes for understanding experiences as modes of presentation and not as reference here. Uh, the cut-ups, the film features on the story level, a series of images that may articulate Barus and his collaborators' ideologically motivated aims, namely a wish to reveal normative rules of social interaction, to show the forms of language control and its preconditioning constraints, culturally formed and socially shared. To achieve this goal, they, in this film also, they demonstrate a range of cultural stereotype, prejudice, and knowledge accepted as self-evident. Burroughs considers the use of cut-up technique to be a liberation from the control imposed by words. Cut-ups, according to him, uh, showed how contemporary culture manipulates a people's consciousness. And language is seen as uh, the means of control that locks us into conventional automated way of thinking. Therefore, cut-up technique was a way to counteract this control through new unexpected combinations and meaning constructions, thereby showing that all the so-called unconditional truths were cultural constructs. And it was also this interest in the effects of film on the mind that was one of the thematic centers in the cut-ups. As uh, Jan Somerville noted, I quote, films impose an external rhythm on consciousness, changing the ways in the brain that are individual like fingerprints, end of quote. The Cut-Ups was the first film made entirely using this technique and Anthony Belt, the director, cut all the original materials shot in various uh, locations, New York, London, Tangier, and gave them to a specially hard person who did the uh, purely mechanical montage work. 
and the goal of the montage and the cut-ups was for the viewer to have time to grasp what is depicted, but not to understand the content in full details. In a situation of a short appearance of visual stimuli, the cognitive system needs about 80 to 100 milliseconds to process them in order to cognitive synthesis to form as a result of neural stimulation. If during the same time the second stimulus appears, it retrospectively affects the reconstruction of the first. That is, the cognitive synthesis of the first stimulus is mixed with the elements of the second stimulus. And Burroughs himself suggested uh, that uh, cut-ups made visible or exposed psychosensory processes and recreated the continual fragmentation of sensory experiences. Such uh, processes in any case always occur and the consciousness of any person is, uh, I quote here, the opposition of what is happening outside and what do you think about it, end of quote. So the film, as you can see and remember, consists of short frames mounted very precisely in duration, but without much attention to the content of the shots. The scenes are also structured accordingly to the length on the reel and not to the course of the narration. The only principle consistently applied in the film is the removal of the coherent linear narrative structure. Storytelling here has been both multiplied and problematized. Among the images, there are many possible potential stories like Geisin wandering around Paris, or Boris, uh, looking as dream machine and so on. The soundtrack of the film consists of uh, the voices of Burroughs and Geisin, who constantly uh, repeat in a different sequence several phrases. Yes, hello, look at this picture and so on. The text uh, which the read in turn comes from Scientology classes and is designed to develop perception as well. At different junctures of the film, it seems that it could equally transform the viewer's plot-related expectations and at the same time transform the very experience of a film viewing. Especially, it is a very good observable um, at the end of the film where the pace is accelerated. Each of the units of this cut-up text bears the considerable train of meanings, connotations, and possible cultural interpretations. Hence, the film can be interpreted as following the principles of surrealistic automatic writing, tracing um, the unconscious movement of illusions and associations. However, the themes and meanings are semiotically weakened by being transformed into pulsating visual succession of the unthinkable multiplicity of images overwhelming the viewer. The film requires the viewer to experience and as a result to interpret it in a different way in such a multi-level interpretation as a play of light and movements uh, devoid of rational logic and um, conventional narration. Instead, the relationship of the audience with the film would be based on the assessments of the nature of experience. Instead of consuming a text or an image, there is a literary, physically, physical experiment of experience of involvement, participation, and reconstruction. And to summarize, the cut-up works are difficult to perceive 
as a coherent text, they have no consistent development. But nevertheless, in the process of perception and because of emotional, physical, even physical involvement in experiencing a rhythmic and semantic repetition of visual images, viewers can form their own stories based on the cues directly or indirectly follow from what is happening on the screen and triggering a sequence of perceptual, cognitive and emotional processes. And uh, the kata problematizes the way in which a texture of meaning is created from combinations of images, words and sounds uh, so the film may be interpreted as a dramatic reenactment, an attempt to represent with the moving images the nature of experience that, according to Redican and activism, is, I quote, a kind of non-conceptual embodied engagement rather than a presentation of a world which is conceptually saturated, end of quote. And by questioning the nature of experiences, the film catops reconsiders the conceptions of the essence of its medium rather than just expressing or rendering mental states. The film suggests a method to construct models for exploration of mind processes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daria, for this very clear presentation of the kind of film um, and also an entry into the perce into perception, which also is a link to eventually the first um, the first uh, speaker. Um, so now um, I'm introducing Tongi. Uh, Tongi, I'm so happy to see you back. And also, so um, Tangi uh, was educated in France and in the UK. He received his PhD in English in 2018 from Goldsmiths, and I was there when he did. So now um, I'm happy that you're here with a new also project. Um, he has taught uh, for the University of Minnesota, for Goldsmiths, and for the University of Southampton. And he is about to take an appointment in the Department of English Language and Literature at Istanbul Kultur University. Um, in the meantime, uh, he continues his exploration of the writings of the counterculture, and he is currently completing a first uh, research monograph uh, entitled Paradox of Thanatos, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, From Self-Destruction to Self-Liberation, um, to be published by Peter Lang um, uh, next February. So. Um, Tangi uh, is going to speak about counterculture, counter counterpower, disengagement, and the art of the beat generation. Tangi, maybe your mic is not on. Uh, we can't hear you. I think there is. Yes, a can you hear me now? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Yes, um, I was just saying that, yes, disengagement, the art of a big generation, this, um, this is actually uh, the title of, um, of an essay by Kenneth Rexroth um, from 1957, which I'm going to uh, explore uh, in, this, in this presentation. Um, there is a case to be made about what actually brings the beats together under the same label. And although vastly heterogeneous, the beat movement finds its common denominator, arguably, in a shared disagreement with the conditions of contemporaneous reality. That of mid-century mid America, whose founding genius had been traded for a prosperous economy, a devouring mania for social control, and a mortiferous lifestyle. This reality, often mechanized and standardized, was devised by the beats as told in spiritless a reality which they thought jeopardized the integrity of the self and liquidated the singularity of human existence. 
This disagreement with the modern predicament, the mainstay of beat writing, is what brings a darker tonality to many other works. It carries a sense of disappointment repeatedly reaffirmed with the national ideals of liberty and of the pursuit of happiness, reconfigured in the beat imaginary as a quest for transcendence. While the beats are identified as the moral failure of these ideals, stems in great measure from the regulations and restrictions forced upon the individual by the historical agents of power, be they economic, social, or cultural. Viewed as thoroughly alienated, they are thought to tame the intuitive energies of the self and to hamper action, whether individual or collective. And ultimately, these constrictions thwart the very promises that America vowed to deliver in the first place. Although fundamentally heterogeneous, the majority of beat literary works manifest in their own ways a world to escape social conditioning and reclaim one's own authority over that of society. A recurring fixation for beat writers, which they shared not only with the existentialists, but also with the transcendentalists a century before them. As John Title contains in Naked Angel, Naked Angels, quote, the beats had to find new ways to remind them to remind their culture of the dignity of self-reliance and to provide an innocent awareness of the tyranny of institutions. Execrating the worldly, dreading the implications of control, they chose to consecrate the whims of the individual." Unquote. While most beat writers did not so much execrate the wealthy and seek to subvert its profanity, the works foreground a rebellious impulse against the institutions and the conventions of daily reality. They view these conventions as mediocre, vitiated and self repressing infringing more or less insidiously upon the elemental liberty of the self. This emphasis on the singularity of the individual character and on the unlimited resources of the self is key in beat writing. It typifies the desire to retrieve from ethical, ontological, and even epistemological authenticity, which is seen as under attack in the hostile environment of the post war era. This urge is predicated on the search for radical subjectivity and self fulfillment of the main ideologies of the 20th century and totalitarian systems to rampant commercialism have crippled. Kenneth, Kenneth Rexworth, in his essay, Disengagement the Arts of the Beat Generation, identifies the struggle to reclaim control over the potency and the legitimacy of the self in the adverse conditions of the post war era as a hallmark of the beat movement. For Rexroth, any individual in his right mind has no other choice than to whistle, to whistle from social reality in order to preserve the integrity of the deeper self. And this is what he says here. The youngest generation is in a state of revolt so absolute that its elders cannot even recognize it. The disaffiliation, alienation, and rejection of the young has moved out of the, of the visible spectrum altogether. Conceived as a corollary to the conditions of 1950s America, such a type of revolt is viewed by Rexford as not only legitimate but necessary. Crucially, it is implemented by an act of disengagement from socio historical reality, through which the individual may create a space which is, in principle, preserved from the most alienating aspects of the latest historical developments of the personal moment. Rexford Quote, it is impossible for an artist to remain true to man, true to himself as a man, let alone an artist, a work within the context of his society. Unquote. This strategy of disengagement may be envisaged as an attempt to eschew the matrix of post war modernity, an insurrection against the temple through which the access to a more private sense of transcendence may be re established. This is what provides a romantic touch to this revolt, a proclaiming of the imperious need to rescue the truth of the self by pitting the individual against both history and society. Meanwhile, by deserting the historical field of an American, normative discourse tends to prevail upon the most intimate desires of the individual. This revolt is also intrinsically political. It enables the individual to effectively consume the American myth of self-reliance, with his or her own alternative system of values, encapsulating anti-conformism, radical autonomy, 
and self-sufficiency, which Paul Ryan countered the status quo. The Lex Bath approach against the ruin of the world, there is only one defense, the creative act. Nevertheless, Lex Bath draws a red line between the moderate form of disengagement, which is potentially virtuous, and a more radical one, which can be more deleterious and toxic for the self, and through which the slip towards solipsism becomes unavoidable. Hi, uh, Tangi, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. There seems to be a problem with the connection. And uh, the sound sometimes is not coming out very clearly. Uh, do you uh, happen to have a micro um, headphones with a microphone? Um, I think microphone, yeah, it's integrated to, um, uh, to the laptop. Yeah, so you don't have he headphones with a mic? Um, I don't have headphones just now. No. I mean, the sound is just sometimes there seems to be some kind of uh, problem with the connection and sometimes the Sound okay. is coming I think, out I think it's the connection. The connection is not very good here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you, your... Yeah. If you sh maybe if you slow down a little bit, uh, it might be better. Okay. Because sometimes when it's okay. uh, breaking, okay, breaking try, up a Okay. Good. Thanks. Sorry again. Sorry for uh, to interrupt. Okay. Okay. Um. So back to um back to Rex Roth and his idea of, of disengagement. Um with um, the fact that uh, there are two forms of different, uh, two different forms of, of disengagement. Um, one more radical um, and which is certainly more uh, deleterious uh, and toxic for the self. Uh, for expert, quote, the disengagement of a creator who as a creator is necessarily judge is one thing, but the utter nihilism of the empty doubt hipster is another. Between such persons, no true enduring interpersonal relationships can be built. And of course, nothing resembling a true culture or at homeless of men with each other, the work, the loss, the environment. The end result must be the desperation of shipwreck, the despair, the orgies, the ultimate cannibalism, ultimately the cannibalism of the lost life world. I believe, he says, that most of an entire generation will go through voluntarily with an enthusiastically. Here, Rex Roth recognizes that the deliberate self alienation from society, as romantic as it may be, fosters a radical form of individualism that can quickly turn into a nihilistic deviance, a pitfall viewed as a major threat for the counterculture. The danger with this type of individualism that it risks becoming actually counterproductive for the individual by subverting the empirical status of factual reality and replacing it with his or her own entirely subjective perceptions. A reality which becomes more and more self legislating which is established not through the facts of the communal reality, but by one sound fancy. Accordingly, such a type of individualism is detrimental for the collective because the radical freedom that he proclaims is transacted at the expense of social reality, of social responsibility. This brand of individualism constitutes a tendency in American literature that forms the substratum of literary lineage, signaled by writers such as Jack London, John Dos Passos, Henry Miller, and Norman Mailer as well. In his essay, The White Negro, also published in 1957, Mailer promotes a similar type of estrangement for social reality. This estrangement, entirely intentional, prophesies, quote, the liberation of the self from the superego of society, end quote. A liberation envisioned as an act of rebellion that manifests the repudiation of the moral and cultural standards of his time. As Mailer puts it, quote, it advocates from any conventional moral responsibility. Nonetheless, the type of revolt that Mailer advocates is the nihilistic revolt of the anarchists because it has no social relevance. It is the byproduct of an extreme form of individualism, which in its, in its obsession with immaculate forms of liberty and of autonomy, subdues all practical possibilities for social action, which in turn becomes counterproductive for the emancipation of the self. 
While Mailer's revolt is largely provocative in caricature, it pivots in the process of disengagement from society, which echoes the, the strategy of resistance deployed by the counterculture as discussed by Rex Roth in this essay. Conceived as a sine qua non for preserving selfhood and maintaining an existential sense of authenticity, the strategy of disengagement features a major flaw. It fails to realize an alternative political project that is socially relevant, a failure which in turn jeopardizes the possibility for liberation on an individual level. The shortcomings of this strategy also testify to the difficulty to articulate the form of revolt which, is, which simultaneously empowers the community, an empowerment of the collective, which may demand an adjustment of the whims of the self for the sake of a resistance properly countercultural. Thank you. Thank you, Tangi, for your presentation. In fact, sometimes it is, um, you see, everybody seems uh, you have reactions uh, from uh, the participants, Paulina. Um, thank you uh, the, to our three speakers for, um, in fact, this very, um, uh, in, um, well, your three papers actually resonated pretty much, and we moved well probably the the central idea to the first two, and also to your um, Tongi was the idea uh, of perception, but also we moved from Darius' um, idea of an activism uh, reenactment to your uh, disengagement uh, and Red Rock's disengagement. So I think we just moved into this 50s and 60s, giving us a quite um, um, a good picture of uh, maybe what was um, the, well, the state of mind and what spurred actually art and the big art and um, the big generation. So um, I know that uh, from the chat that Carol had um, uh, questions. Uh, if uh, you do have question, please uh, raise your hand in uh, with the reaction tool, so that um, the, I mean, you can be given um, uh, time to speak and ask your question, and then eventually I will just go back and ask my own question as well. Uh, maybe we can start with Carol since you had this, uh, uh, you wanted to speak. Uh, Carol, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think it's Steve, is, is that you or that unmute the, the mics and the video? There. She can do Okay, you can okay. do Okay, I got unmuted. <laughs> it's sometimes <laughs> difficult. Uh. Um, I'm asking a question for Beatrice. Um, she mentioned that the um, all of the beat writers pretty much to a person had painted or had done some form of visual art. Um, my question is, is uh, has she found that many of the beat artists have also you know, been serious writers, um, or at least writing and, you know, creative ways. Uh, the one that comes to mind for me is Ira Cohen, who uh, gained his fame as a, a filmmaker, but had actually preferred to be remembered as a poet. And this is for Beatrice. Yes. Hi, Carol. Thank you for your question. Hi. Yeah, I am. I am aware. I was just um, trying to call attention on the on the on this prejudice that I um, Daria also talked about. I feel like I was not talking so much about like this obscure members of the beginning generation. By no means, uh, Kerouac was an excellent painter, and he took it very seriously. It was not something that he did on Sundays, it was not a Sunday painter. Yeah, okay. He really cared about his painting, his um, art, his visual production, I find very compelling. Um, I'm just thinking uh, in the 
In the exhibition that I was mentioning in NYU in 1994, uh, some of his paintings were considered to be too good and people did not believe that it was his work, which is completely absurd. Uh, he also, as you know, was is very meticulous about everything that he did. He kept very interesting diaries. And there is uh, one particular painting uh, called The Eagle uh, that he record, like when he did it and what he was thinking and he was, what was he intending, et cetera, et cetera. And people still was commenting on the show like, oh, this, this is too good. It can't be a Kerouac because he is a writer. And so like, this is just an anecdote, but it happens also with Boris' uh, photographs, which are, I think, unquestionably wonderful. And that uh, he, again, uh, was very prolific. He kept um, extensive archives of all his work. Uh, and um, I, I'm, I don't think that one thing is taking away the talent from the other discipline by no means. What, uh, the only thing that I wanted to raise is that why the visual work that the uh, Big Nicks did hasn't reached the um, consideration that I think is obvious for all of us that it should have reached, uh, 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 obtained already. And um, my thesis is that even though both uh, groups or generations, the abstract expressionist and the big generation were dealing with the same issues and they were having very similar lives. Um, the big generation is seen still sadly as these outcasts, uh, almost criminals, uh, obviously drug uh, addicts and drug abusers. And so, well, the abstract expressionists were alcoholics. It's not really that far away. Um, you know, Pollock and the Kunin's moral life and relationships is yeah. nothing to be especially proud of. So why are the Bidniks always considered in like, you know, under this moral lens? Um, and I think it, it really has hurt the public acceptance of in particular their visual art because it's normally compared to the abstract expressionists. I, I think I agree with you because, you know, my study of the the artists I've become acquainted with and tracking down their works. Um, they, uh, the beats are an interesting phenomenon in that there is such an outpouring of all aspects of culture. It's not just a literary movement, but it, it's been viewed that way. But it, in various forms of art, um, you know, it was quite phenomenal and overlooked very much overlooked. Um, the abstract expression of, you know, gained that recognition um, because of the way I think the art world works and especially art collectors. They have a tremendous influence on who gets recognized and who doesn't. Yeah. I want to thank you for your presentation. It was thank very you. interesting. Thank you for your question. You're welcome. Yeah, I think that what you have raised is the one major issue is that basically um, the problem was that it's not that they were not um, doing a lot of, I mean, they were not experiencing in a lot of uh, genre or domains uh, that they were in fact photographers, visual artists, poets, fiction writers, uh, etc., performers, but that um, the issue of categorization basically um, just put them in a cluster. And it has followed them for such a long time that now, in fact, we have to break that and just see that there is more connection. Uh, I mean, it's not, they have always been there, but they have been overlooked. Looked. So um, this is exactly what you, you meant. And uh, in fact, especially I think in the, on the San Francisco Bay Area, there has been this connection between uh, the two of them and constant dialogue. And when you were saying um, one one language, uh, but two destinies, uh, I would have even said it's, it's like what Joseph Alpers was saying, it's one plus one is not two. 
it's three plus more than three. And then this is the same for the beat generation and the beat artist is not just one language, two destinies is more than that. Um, I just would like to uh, ask you a question, Daria, um, in relation to Tangi's uh, presentation. And I was wondering if you would like to react on the issue on the disengagement of the creator um, in relation to um, Boros and Bolter's film, actually. Uh, yeah, thank you, Peggy. It's a really big issue because um, as uh, Burroughs or Geissen uh, motivated their use of cut-ups, they uh, suggested that uh, they that one should make cut-up mechanically to eliminate this individual factor. And this is uh, just um, chance principle which connects various fragments. But um, as a result, as we see their text, we see their films, we can find that this text bear some personal um personal involvement i i'm not sure about disengagement of the creator here I was also think I asked you this question because at some point in time, uh, I mean, um, along your um, presentation, and I, I don't remember where I've written that down, but um, it sounded that uh, on the one hand, I mean, there is this idea of the disengagement of the creator, but at the same time, there is this re-engagement or mm -hmm. reenactment of the viewer and the perceiver. So this is exact, perhaps that was this dialogue between the two perception that uh, I was wondering, I'm not a borough specialist, so this is a real genuine question uh, in the sense that, um, but we do have borough specialists in the, in the room. So maybe they can just pop in and... Um, Or, or maybe if there are um, other questions that you would uh, perhaps like to ask um, to the presenters, to the speakers. Uh, Jim, would you like to read that, uh, read uh, me to read your uh, question in the chat or can you just, or do you wanna ask your question yourself? Maybe the mic is not functioning. Yes. I'll ask it, yeah. Hello, okay, go ahead, Jim, hello. Well, I'll skip the video, okay? Um, yeah, is there anywhere in the cut-ups a use of dissolve or mixing or even subliminal cut-ins? Because I understood it was all just jump cuts. You know, just, you know, like, I think it was exactly a foot of film from four different reels. And just, and there were four buckets and the lady had to, just took them one after the other and stuck them together. Um, so there was no, no really fancy Hollywood merging or whatever they call it, dissolve, I think it's called, is one of the things. And they're all done. And the film editor apparently was a lady who was employed under virtual slave conditions <laughs> because neither Balch or Burroughs wanted to do that kind of thing. I may be wrong here. I don't remember seeing anything in cut-ups that su suggested a sophisticated uh, film editing technique. Yeah, someone. Uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, there was a special lady who did uh, this montage work, and uh, she cut all the reels in very uh, exact fragments. And after that, they uh, were pasted together just mechanically. There were uh, various uh, plots, but. Uh, they were put together mechanically in order to eliminate this um, narrative development. And yet what's, what's intriguing is the uh, voiceovers, the, the, the dialogue is not cut up. It, it, it's just repeated mm -hmm. throughout and there's no relationship to any of the randomness of the um, 
the four films that were used. Uh, it's just it's just overlaid in a kind of um, yeah a texture rather than having any coherence to what was on the screen. And yes, uh, it's uh, uh, like a little bit uh, in direction of Geissen's permutations poems when he. Um, made a repetition of a words and a phrase for many, many, many times in order to, to make a, a listener to think about the possible meanings of the words and the elimination of this meaning and to impose other possible connections between the words. So with the soundtrack and this film where uh, the uh, Burroughs and Geissen um, keep um, saying these uh, words from Scientology classes. Uh, and uh, this um, was an um, exercise to develop perception. So as, as I suggested that the film subject is, there is modes of perception so the soundtrack works in this direction. Yeah, um, except that, not except that, but that, that um, Scientology routine that they use was, was more used to kind of, it was an auditing technique to actually break down the poor subject of who was being audited, almost to kind of um, hypnotize him because they repeated it a lot and they uh, and that thing look at that look at this picture there was another one they had a they actually had a light up in the in the auditing room which would flick flick on and off a, uh, uh, can you see that light is it persisting um as and that's what film is about film is the persistence of image on a screen um yeah so it's a lovely soundtrack but it's not I don't think it was designed to increase communication I got a feeling it was anything but actually the way Scientology works um yeah thanks yeah nice uh, nice to see the film uh re-emerging uh surfacing and being uh, and someone having a go at interpreting it actually because uh, otherwise it's just so uh, it's just abstract isn't it I'm going to mute myself. Thank you, Jim. Uh, da Daria, would, uh, would you like to react to the words we have? Uh, Eric, who wishes to, um, who has raised uh, virtually his hand, and we also have Peter. So, um, Daria, would you have to? Would you like to add something? Or no? Okay. So maybe Eric, um, you go first, and then um, uh, and then Peter goes. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you all for the papers. They're all very good. Can you hear me? I... Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this was this question sort of prompted by uh, Tanguy's presentation in a quote, but uh, I think it applies to everybody. Um, one of the one of the quotes I think from Titel, it mentions you know the beats sort of anti-institutional stance at the same time their their desire for personal self-expression. And I think all the papers kind of touched on that. Uh, which I think is generally true. But I, I was wondering, what do we do uh, with, you know, writers and artists, I guess, like these who are, you know, sort of see themselves as outside the system or want to be outside the system or are avant-garde pushing boundaries and rejecting social parameters, et cetera. And at the same time, also clearly are in, have to engage or want to engage, especially in the art world, for instance. I mean, um, I forgot which presenter, but, you know, this, this you know, the, looking at abstract expressionists who, ended up in, in Life magazine and had, uh, you know, international uh, exhibitions or even the Beats who, you know, still um, wanted to be published. They wanted to, to get published by big publishing presses. They wanted to sell books. Uh, so is there a contradiction? I mean, this is sort of an age old question, I guess, but is this, is there a contradiction in that? And how do we, what do we do with that? Um, I don't know who would, <laughs> who wants to answer the one million uh, dollars question. Uh, I don't think that there is an answer to to this human contradiction. Um, it just uh, in the case of the abstract expressionist in particular, 
it's very interesting because they all said that they were racing against the system. They were not interested in what was happening in the museum. But uh, in my, my first slide had a photograph of the Irascibles, who was this um, group of artists who sent, signed this letter to the New York Times, uh, public, publicly uh, protesting the conservative views of the Metropolitan Museum. And it was one of the, and it was published in Life Magazine. It was the, the one event that really uh, spearhead their art to, to media and to the public. Um, so they were saying, you know, we are the counterculture, we, we are the advanced artists, but at the same time, as you said, they want to be seen, they want to uh, make a living, they want to pay the rent like everybody else. Um, and with the, with the big generation, it happens um, the, the same thing. I think that it happens, it's a contradiction that pretty much every artist have to live with. They want to be free to create whatever they want, but at the same time, they want to be recognized. I mean, the Nike advertising that um, came in the 90s by Burrs, it's, uh, it was kind of like a slap in the face for many because, um, but I don't know, it's a, uh, um, I, I would love to hear what other speakers have to say. I think that it's a contradiction that we all have to live with. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think so as well. I think so. it's a major contradiction. Um, it's, a, it's a very, um, it's a very tough uh, question, um, this one. Uh, but then I have a feeling that maybe from the avant-garde um, or from very experimental movements or from soft writing or, or art expressions, um, maybe one of, the, um, um, one of the only possibilities would be um, to contaminate society little by little, um, gradually. And, Maybe this is not the view of some of the some of the members of these um, of these movements. Uh, this is still something that can be done. Uh, I'm thinking of Ginsburg, for instance, who had a, um, this kind of um, this role of, as a, as a spokesman of of a, of a degeneration. Um, when many uh, many writers, many writers were not really interested in in, in this channel between the counterculture and the more a more generic, um, like the, the general um, members of the, of the public. Uh, but he did it. And then that was the, from the 50s onwards. And um, in the 60s, certainly there is a little bit, a little bit of Ginsburg in the, in the civil rights movement, etc. So uh, there might have been uh, an influence of, of the Beats. Uh, but at the same time, many people were not interested in that. Um, possibly uh, Burroughs was interested in, in other forms of um, Maybe impacting society at, at a very different level, uh, but not not in the social uh, scale directly, I believe, um, and, and others. Um, so yes, it's, it's full of contradictions, I would say. Sorry, may I add something else very quickly? That when comparing these two groups, I think that there is also I, I want to make this clear that there is a really big difference between the abstract expressionists and the, and the uh, beat generation. Uh, when you think of artists like uh, Barnum Newman or Clifford Steele, who were um, not only artists, but they were also representatives of their, or, of their own work. They had very, very clear um, direction in the way they wanted to be shown, in the, one, in the way they wanted their paintings to be hung, for instance, or in which kind of room, et cetera, et cetera. While, I'm um, thinking of George Corso, for instance, who is a very good painter, very, he has a very decent uh, corpus. Uh, his work is basically impossible to trace now because uh, he was selling so cheap um, the, or just giving away his art directly that we basically don't have documentation. So there it was a difference between the way they um, wanted to enter the mainstream or not between the two groups. Um, I think that it's not between, I mean, if I can just pop in on this, it's maybe we cannot really make a generalization out of that because as Tangi said, there are some personalities that actually have made their way like Ginsburg, but Ferlinghetti was also pretty much one who was um, evocative and that made a transition in this counterculture, but I'm thinking of McClure as well. 
Um, so maybe not all of them, it's just that, in fact, the, there is this connection and maybe the, this disengagement, and, but um, as a group, they are so different. So some of them did enter and mediatize or use the media for that in their own way, and others did not, and uh, like her work. Um, so, um, but I just wanted to pop in there. Uh, Daria, do you have, um, do you want to pop in with that question answer to Eric or um... I'm just totally agree with you Peggy and I, I think that uh, we should uh, consider every single case every single artist and uh, his own strategies because the generalization are, are helpful but not precise <laughs> Well, they are ample, and, and if I may just say, for instance, Cliff, uh, Clifford Stills was a good, was a real influence for um, McClure, for instance, and um, and some of the San Francisco beats. Uh, I mean, in general, artists and poets. Some of them, uh, at a certain point, even wanted to uh, did not recognize with uh, the term beat. Uh, I'm thinking of Bruce Connor, who actually had created this Red Bastard Protective Association, and he would rather call himself a Red Bastard instead of a beat. But at the same time, he shared their ideology as well. So you see, within the group itself, there is this complex um, relationship to art uh, and to aesthetics, to uh, politics and to culture, which is really ambiguous. But that's what makes the B generation. That's that's why we are here also today. Um, Peter had a question. Maybe if you want to just um, um, pop in, Peter. The... Yes, I have a question to Daria. Um, we have seen uh, some, uh, the movie is a cut ups and uh, one, uh, String, one film uh, was filmed by Anthony uh, Walsh, and he filmed uh, himself uh, during he, is, uh, he was uh, masturbating. Um, and I just want uh, to ask, because it's uh, a little bit uh, obviously in this film, um, what was, what do you think? What was his intention? What do, does he want uh, to shock uh, the, the public? Mm. Well, I'm not sure <laughs> I can explain here the film which was not <laughs> in my presentation and um, maybe it was his intention, maybe not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, there are a number of such uh, similar films at the time, I, I uh, don't uh, mean the masturbation itself, but when um, Andy Warhol, for instance, um, filmed for many hours the sleep or more similar example, blowjob, or the Empire State Building, this uh, maybe we we can connect with attempts to, to present some natural processes as they are, as uh, they can be perceived by the viewers we, we, as if without uh, interruption of uh, the artist's will or so, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Are there um, any more questions to um, our speakers or for our speakers? No? Um, Tangi, maybe I just wanted to hear a little bit more um, about um, this idea of the emphasis of the self, because for me, and as um, Eric has pointed out, there is this, in fact, uh, paradox of the two. And I could never quite reconcile also um, this um, 
well, this put forward of the self, the body, um, and um, how would you um, just maybe, or if you have uh, done some research on that, um, maybe uh, just speak a little bit more, uh, for instance, uh, because you're, you've done a lot on Kerouac, so maybe, um, and have you ever looked into, um, well, uh, Beatrice was mentioning his painting. Is there something that we can just um, maybe develop on this idea through the paintings? Have you looked into that? Um, through the painting, not, uh, not particularly, but um, the idea of, of this engagement to preserve um, the self food in a way, because um, this was very strong, for instance, with, uh, with K. Reich, with Ginsberg. Um, first of all, the idea is that the environment is seen as um, hostile and uh, preempting um, the um, uh, wish, the will, and the, um, the desires of the self. Um, but these desires are articulated through from a quest uh, for transcendence. Um, and for Kirak, for instance, the cultivation of this transcendence can be, can be only private. Um, it, is, um, it is something which is so um, deeply personal um, that along his career, he developed a way of a means of reaching, um, reaching a form of transcendence, which is more in tune with a with a deeper a deeper self, which is also inspired by the American traditions of um, of transcendentalism. For, for instance, I'm thinking of Emerson. Um, and for for Kirak, you, you've got this major um, movement which is going inwards, um, and it's the idea of the self against um, against society, against history as well. It's the idea that. Uh, transcendence, um, which is um, which is included in the self, but can only be um, achieved and developed by turning inwards. And so, this propagates a form of um, a very strong form of disengagement from um, from the social world uh, in general. Um, and I think I can see that as explaining Kirak's disaffiliation from um, from the group of the beats more generally in the, in the sixties. Um, especially in the second part of his of his career. Thank you, thank you. Um, we still have, we, we have um, ten minutes left, so we can just continue maybe on um, perhaps raising also questions about because the panel was um, on the beats and. Um, art. So um, Carol started engaging uh, these questions. Maybe um, if there are no longer any questions, specific questions on um, the um, presentation per se, uh, maybe we can just continue with the 10 minutes that we have left, maybe engage uh, with your reaction or your knowledge about this um, uh, this interaction, intermingling between, uh, I would say, um, poetry as uh, in, in a large sense, uh, poetry and fiction and art, not perhaps just painting, but visual art in general, and maybe see how just they resonate or how um, they, co I mean, artists collaborated, painters collaborated um, in time within the movement. Carol. Yeah, Carol, the floor is yours. Because, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, at least I'm unmuted. Um, I'm not addressing that in particular, but because of the, the work I've done on who the beat art this were those who were the people themselves primarily as artists, uh, even if they did a lot of other things, they thought of themselves as visual artists. Uh, I'm, I'd like to know the names that our panelists have come across. I haven't heard much uh, mention of the artists themselves. So um, the ones I, of course, have studied are um, um, Aaron Madsen and Bill Heine in particular, and also 
Bob Branahan and um, and excuse my senior moment, Arthur. I'll, I'll get back with you. Arthur is uh, still living and an artist in San Francisco or in Oakland rather. And um, Bob Branham, as far as I know, is still living. Um, did you come across those names? Did you, uh, have you looked at the works of other artists? I mean, we, I think we're just uncovering a lot of this information. Um, so uh, sharing it would be very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Beatrice, one of my question actually is because I'm I'm on an ongoing project on that on um, collaboration between artists, po poets, and uh, visual artists in the mid '50s and '60s. And one of my question, and this is um, perhaps you can answer that, um, is their connection to the east, uh, to the East Coast artists, West Coast artists, with East Coast artists, especially. New York School and Fluxus Artists, so the Rogers University um, group. Um, George Brash, for instance, um, and uh, their collaboration between poetry and visual art, but also poetry, performance, and visual art. And how these, I mean, the first that they did was early, well, mid 1950s. So, how they in fact resonated in the West Coast, or if they did, and through what means, et cetera. So, I wondered if you had looked into some of these, I mean, um, uh, artists uh, and could perhaps just see any connection with what has been said in terms also of uh, hope and email consciousness. Daria mentioned that, fragmentation, randomness, the use of different forms like uh, the I Ching or the concept, the Chinese concept, Ma, this thing that are in the art of this um, Eastern um, art, I mean, East Coast artist, and that have shifted or have been I don't know about what kind of translation, if it is, so this is a real question, shifted to the West Coast artist and be poets and San Francisco Renaissance group, actually. Hi, um, I'm afraid I don't know the, uh, uh, the artists that Carol is mentioning. And as I said in the beginning, I am, um, I am just presenting um, uh, this, but it's an ongoing investigation and I am not an expert in, in this uh, period. But um, I think that what you are um, um, proposing, uh, Peggy, is, is just that it, it is us who are doing this kind of differences as we were mentioning before, right? Like they did not really talk about, oh, now I'm doing, now it's time to do my visual work and now it's time to do my writing work. And, you know, for it's like the, the magical thing about this group of artists is how they were writing the interwaving paths of music, literature and, and visual arts. And they did not make any difference. Um, and it, I mean, it's what we always uh, hear when we hear the big generation, right? It's like the artist the visual artists were going to concerts and the musicians were reading the books and going to readings. And it was just a very, very rich uh, uh, experience for all of them. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the, of the, oh, the East Coast and West Coast. Um, I am more familiar with the East Coast uh, scene that the that what it was happening in in California for sure. But oh, I was gonna say that um, even uh, Kerouac used to talk about uh, how he was sketching instead of writing, right? Like he called his writing his sketching, uh, and uh, it was uh, this man from the from I think Colorado who I'm um, completely blocking Eric something from. Uh, this architect, I forgot the last name, Eric White? No, it was an architect that suggested to Kerouac that he should do, instead of writing, uh, he, should, he should sketch. And for many years, Kerouac thought of his writing, like take it like as painters sketch outdoors, he should go to the streets and sketch the 
the, the language that he was listening to in the streets. So for them, there was not really that differentiation. It was just such an ongoing creative experience between the visual arts and, and all the other language. And uh, as for my experience, I have seen uh, mostly the artwork of the artists that I have mentioned. Um, I think that Steve Leith uh, uh, have sent a link about, about this, so we can maybe check the, the, um, um, the chat. And of course, uh, Antonio Bonomi is saying something about Rosenberg. Rosenberg is the art critic that was closer uh, his vision of abstract expressionism was actually closer to the B generation um, um, experience also, um, especially because of his focus on the physical act of the, that the painters were doing, that he was the one who set the, the um, premise to start talking about happening and performing in, within uh, still the visual arts. Thank you. In fact, it, you mentioned the physical act in Daria. This is, I mean, you, I don't think you have mentioned this idea of physical, but you've mentioned perception, but uh, what is also the physical reaction to the films? Because um, it's not just about perception, but per well, uh, for me, to perceive, I mean, perception is not just linked with, but it's also physical. So perhaps just maybe to conclude, you would like to react on that. Um, how would you introduce this physical act also uh, within your approach um, of the this Bolch and Boros film perhaps? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, it's about the disturbance the viewer can feel during the watching the film and uh, as uh, any perception can be interpreted as an interactive activity from both sides, from the viewer and from the film. It's a kind of exchange of emotions, of feelings, something like this in this direction, I think. And also, also we uh, should uh, take into account the environment in which this experience occur. I mean, it depends when you uh, watch the movie sitting at home or you are in the cinema theater and it also makes yes. The body in environment make an impact on your impressions and on your experiences. Well, um, thank you for um, concluding on that, Daria. So I think, um, I mean, um, we need to put an end to this panel, but not an end to the conversation because there will be break up, break up rooms. So, uh, but I really like to thank um, our three speakers for their um, very good presentation and introduction. I mean, not introduction, but um, glimpse into their particular focus. Um, Estibal is um, just giving you the end now so that uh, I don't know how it goes. Uh, if yeah, we well, go back to. Yeah, thank you all again for the papers and Peggy for such a wonderful job uh, chairing the session. So we have 30 minutes until the next uh, panels. Uh, we have panel three uh, in room one, which is not this link, and panel four, which will be in this room, okay? So if you wanna stick around and for panel four, you can simply stay in the room and I'll uh, bring you to uh, the break room, breakup rooms. So you have more space to continue the discussion if you want. If you wanna take a break, you can of course take a break. <laughs> We're human. <laughs> and then be back at five, either in this link for panel four or the other link uh, for panel three, okay? Thank you all for um, being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.